Havana is another town that's really special to me. It's not a town, it's a city. It has grown so much, and it's not special because I particularly enjoy fighting swarms of tourists, even in the winter, just to see the place, but because it's the last trip I got to take with my grandmother, not the grandmother who's always slashing her middle finger, the other one from Holland who taught me everything I know about baking, who had huge boobs and loved to brag about them, and who read Fifty Shades of Grey and called me to discuss it. The best way to see Savannah is to put on your walking shoes and get as far away from the shopping centers and tourist area down at the water. Pro tip, if you pay to park in Savannah, you best be selling in Oregon soon because it is crazy expensive. They know it's a tourist town, they make their money that way. So, pro tip, go across the bridge, park at the convention center for $5 all day long, your car will be fine, and you get a free ferry ride. So, I've got to take the ferry in, um, you get to see the riverfront from just a whole new perspective than the one when you are dodging drunk bachelorette parties and it's just a really nice way to start the day. Unfortunately, it has been pouring rain except for this little break that I got since I got into Savannah and the only upside of that is that when the weather sucks and you are a videographer slash photographer, it forces you to take pictures in a different way. Let's start with the retaining wall that is out by the river. They had to build that because, well, in a beachy area, uh, in order to keep the city from sliding into the river, they had to construct this massive retaining wall. And the sidewalk, or rather anywhere that you put your feet down there, uh, you'll notice very round, very large stones. That's ballast. So a ballast rock is something that you would add to your ship to stabilize its weight. And then when you got into port and you were ready to uh, load up your goods, and take them back wherever you came from. So you would unload the ballast, you would throw it overboard, and then you would put all whatever you were transporting on board. And that way you maintain stability of the ship out on the ocean. So any of our coastal communities, if you see rock, it is not because we mined it out of a mountain here, it's ballast. It was once on a ship, and now it is a cobblestone street. This area is called Factor's Walk, and Factor refers to the cotton brokers who worked in those very tall buildings on the left, and then on the other side we have the retention mall. And so what the Factors would do is they would head across, or walk, Factor's Walk, across those iron walkways, and they would look down and see what had just been brought in off the ships and negotiate prices right there. And that is how we got the name, Factor's Walk. Savannah gets a lot of street cred because it is known as the city that was just so beautiful that Sherman did not pillage it to the ground and it was saved uh, and some of that beauty was rather tactical. In fact, if you'll notice, a lot of Savannah, if you look at the street grids, uh, is structured around these center garden squares and as I understand it initially, that was where you would keep your animals. So everyone around the square would then keep their animals in those green areas uh, and keep them nearby, which is really hard to do if you lived in a city. Now, I'm not quite sure that that's exactly true because it's not really consistent with being a wealthy merchant and, you know, wanting to keep your pigs not too far out of sight. The other theory or fact, maybe someone can help me out on this one, is that they wanted to confuse any invading armies. So if you are walking around Savannah like I am, you get lost kind of quick because you keep stumbling into these little garden city squares and you lose your orientation pretty quickly because you're wondering, wasn't I just here? But they're all over. Of course, the very famous Forrest Gump on a bench shot was in one of these squares. It is hilarious to watch tourists painfully try to find which one was the one that Tom Hanks sat on for Forrest Gump. Insider tip, it's not out here anymore. It would have been destroyed by tourists. Instead, it's in a museum, so I'll just save you that little crusade. Savannah has a really gritty history that I just adore. 
Some of my girlfriends used to work in news down here and they said that every time they do a construction project they find skeletons because at the time that Savannah was rocking and rolling it was totally appropriate to bury your loved ones in your backyard. The phrase funeral parlor, well that comes parlor, parlor in a home, you would take off a door, lay your loved one out in the parlor and then uh, just throw them in the backyard. So today they're constantly finding skeletons in Savannah. I don't know why that happens here and not elsewhere, but um, maybe it's just for the haunted allure that Savannah offers. Savannah's ghost tour is one of the best I've ever been on, except for Scotland, but you can't compete with Scotland because they were like torturing each other and stuff like that. Because I'd like to support those tours, I'm not going to tell you every ghost story. But this house, this is now an inn, and the background on this building is so bizarre that I'd really love to know which one of these stories is true and which one isn't. I mean, everything from picking apart bodies in the basement uh, to the one that I've heard the most, that a father punished his daughter by putting her upstairs and telling her she couldn't move out of this chair and it was in front of this huge glass window. And if you've ever been in Savannah in the summer, uh, you will melt down here. And that she died of heat exhaustion and is now credited as one of the ghosts who you can hear the children laughing at night. Um, or I've heard that you can, uh, at nighttime, you'll hear like marbles bouncing down the stairs. You can stay there, it's an inn, and I would love to stay there one day, but um, Casey is unemployed, so that's not going to happen. <laughs> Maybe one day. In light of the rain, I did something I usually don't do, which is I actually go into these buildings. <laughs> Typically, I like walking so much, and I want to cover the whole city, that uh, I just pound the pavement. But to seek some refuge from the weather, I went into St. John the Baptist Catholic Church, and this church, every time I've been here, they've been doing some kind of reconstruction or mass was going on. Uh, and I know that no sane church would ever want me around during mass, so I kind of skip on that. Um, but I, I got to go inside and it will blow your mind. I, I mean, it was, I was drooling. The architecture lover in me was just like, I'm not leaving. I'm not, I will become a Catholic just so I can hang out in this building. I don't really mean that. It is the oldest Catholic congregation in Georgia. It's a cathedral, and a church can call themselves the cathedral when it's where the bishop stays. And their bishop has been there since the 1870s. Uh, I don't know why you would move to another city if you were living in Savannah in that kind of a building, but I think he is there for good. I kind of cornered one of the congregation members and asked him all my questions about the building. So I have got a ton to tell you about this building. Uh, it was destroyed in a fire in 1898. I mean, Savannah burned, the South, I think the South was just always on fire at some point or another. Anyway, one stained glass window survived and you have to look really closely to tell which one it is, but it does have kind of a, a different, uh, design and color scheme but in total there are 81 stained glass windows from Austria 81 and if you look around the church and just do kind of like a walk of the perimeter you'll see the 12 stations of the cross they are carved out of wood so intricate I mean just the detail the painstaking detail it must have taken to complete those and each one was done by one carver the pillars throughout the church. I thought they were marble because they look like marble. It's faux marble. <laughs> I just got such a kick out of that. I was like, see, it's what happens when you put your church, start looking on Pinterest and you get all these ideas on how to faux something. The building is actually constructed out of steel and they have somebody come in. It takes them a year to do it, to touch up all the paint for structural reasons. It's probably best 
that it's steel, but get up really close to it. And the second you're within maybe arm's reach, you're like, oh yeah, you know, that's not marble. The floor of the church, now that is marble. The pink marble, that comes from Tennessee. And then the altar is Carrera marble, which if you've ever renovated a house is stupid expensive. That came from Italy. Carrera marble, the composition of the stone, the fact that it doesn't have huge crystals, is very easy to carve and shape and smooth. So the entire altar is made of Carrera. You are not allowed to go anywhere near it, uh, that you can touch the steps, but that's that's kind of it. The interior of the church is in the shape of a cross, which is very common. We see that a lot in Catholic churches, especially in Europe. Look up and you'll see the ceiling ribs. Those are also steel. And where two ribs connect and kind of cross over one another in this domed shape and then are united by a medallion, that is called a groin. And we do not add those to buildings anymore. I don't know why. They're stunning. That whole system, it is structural. It's called a groin. And this is fascinating about the groins and then the buttresses um, that carry out to the side of the building. The entire structure is held up by that roof. You could knock out the walls of the church and it would still be standing. And that is how gigantic churches are able to add these humongous windows on the sides because the walls aren't doing anything. The walls are essentially decorative. Also note on the windows that they are pointed arches. When they were building the church, they wanted to literally point up, like tell people, look up, get off your cell phone. They didn't have cell phones at the time, but stop looking at what you're doing and look up because when you're in church, what should you be doing? Paying attention to upstairs. I loved when he explained that to me when we were inside the church and just I'm kind of staring there in awe of this building because if you remember from the video what, where I explain uh, why I'm doing this trip, I talk about looking up. I talk about when my grandmothers died and all I could think about was them looking up at uh, the ceiling of a hospital. And today, because I went through with it, I am looking up at this beautiful church and in their memory, I went over and lit a candle in their honor and just said hi and it was, it was a pretty cool moment. Let's spin around and look at that big organ. Now that is not an old organ. I think they said it was 1987, but 2,308 pipes. That is going to pretty much wrap up my day in Savannah. It is wet out from sitting on this bench. I now have swamp ass and it's cold. <laughs> um, so Savannah, I really do love this city, but it's really getting packed with human beings. Uh, and it's still winter, so I can't even imagine in the summertime. Um, but if you love history and you love architecture, you really can't beat Savannah, Georgia. Oh, and if you love ghosts, you will see if you um, pick up some real estate brochures. I'll try to find one before I leave. Um, but sometimes a house will list if they have a ghost or not and whether or not it's friendly. And I mean, where else can you get that in America? It's just a really cool city that is very much in love with what they've been through, uh, where they've come from, and they are holding on tight to their quirks and their grit and the fact that they know they're pretty and in Savannah, Georgia, they flaunt it.